So thank you, everybody, for coming. Then we're very fortunate for Dr. Stephanie Jones joining with us. Although her appointment as associate professor in the Department of Neuroscience, her work is really translation because she works to fill the gap between what happened in terms of perception and uh, sensory motor uh, activity with what happened inside the brain in terms of network, the circuits, dynamics, and single cell love. So today she's going to present how she filled the gap here uh, between right. these different modalities as well as presenting a few very nice computational tools that I hope can help us as a scientist. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction. Inviting me to speak. I'm Thank very happy to be here. here. I've never been to UConn. This is a very exciting place and I've enjoyed my reading so far. Um, and I'm really just excited to have the opportunity to talk to this group about my research program. Um, I'm going to specifically talk about a new software tool that we've developed to start to bring hu bridge human EEG and MEG signals to the underlying cell and network dynamics um, that we call human neocortical neurosolver. So I want to begin by giving an overview of the challenge in human neuroscience that we're trying to address. EEG and MEG, we well, all know, are really powerful technologies because they give us measures of human brain activity in awake behaving humans with millisecond resolution. The biomarkers of all sorts of healthy and abnormal functions. But there's a downside in that what we're recording is considered this macro scale signal. And it's still really difficult to infer what's going on at the underlying cellular and network level to create these signals. And this cellular and network level understanding is really critical if we want to know why these signals correlate with function, or if we want to have any hope of targeting treatments when they're disrupted in neuropathologies. Now, animal recordings invasively and tools like optogenetics and all the cool things we can do now in mice are really ideal for dissecting circuit level dynamics. But there's still real challenges in applying these in the human. And so to bridge this gap, we've been applying computational neural modeling methods. Um, there's actually two types of computational modeling that we need to get from this extracranial signal to what's going on inside the brain. The first type of modeling is called current source estimation models, where we're estimating the location and time course of the underlying electrical currents in the brain that create these sensory level signals. From there, we need to connect these electrical currents to the underlying cellular activity that created these currents. And this is the perfect job for computational neural modeling, where we simulate the electrical activity of the neurons. And we can have specificity both at this microcircuit level and at this macro scale recording level. And this type of neural modeling is the primary focus of my research group. We've recently turned this modeling framework into a user-friendly software tool for the community to be able to start to develop and test predictions on the circuit origin of their EEG or MEG signals. We call it human neocortical neurosolver. It's quite a mouthful, so I'm going to call it HNN. Um, and so today, I'm going to be describing how we've applied mm -hmm. HNN to study some of the most commonly measured EEG signals in health and disease. And so the outline of my talk is as follows. I'm first going to give you some background on the development of this new tool, and then I'm going to move into a, an application where we've been studying the mechanisms and meaning behind a really prominently measured EEG signal known as a beta rhythm. It's a 20 hertz oscillation. We've been studying this in the content of somatosensory perception. At the end of the talk, I'll give you a brief tour of this software and describe some other applications and ongoing um, expansions that we're working on. Now, I understand we have an hour and a half. This is quite a long talk, but I'm happy throughout to answer questions that you guys have. We have plenty of time, um, or if you want to wait till the end, either way is fine by me. But if anything's really confusing, please just raise your hand. Okay, so let's start with some background information. How do we go about building this tool to study the circuit origin of these signals? Well, at any, in any way you do this, modeling the neural dynamics consists of developing a system of differential equations that describes how the electrical activity of neurons changes over time. I'm not going to get into the math at all, but I do want to give you a sense of the complexity that's involved in creating 
this system of differential equations, there's various scales of detail that you can build in to your model depending on the question that you're interested in. And so just to give you some point of reference, one type of modeling that has a minimal level of complexity is called population modeling or neural mass modeling, where we represent the mean state of an entire population with one dynamical variable. And this is a model with minimal complexity. We could also go in and model the electrical activity of individual neurons and the coupling between them. We can do this in re reduced form and collapse everything about a neuron to one point. We call these point neurons. Now, EEG and MEG primarily are reflecting activity in the cortex, the outer structure of the brain. So we can start to build in some of the anatomy and the physiology of the cortical structure. Or because it's a model, we can simulate all of the detailed anatomy and all of the neurons and all of their synaptic connections. Obviously, the more detailed you build the model, the harder it is to construct, the many more differential equations, the harder it is to compute and simulate, and the harder it is to understand at the end of the day. And so one of the biggest challenges in this field of computational neural modeling is deciding what is the right scale of the model to build to answer the question that I'm interested in. And the model that we've chosen is at this level right here, where we've included some of the anatomy and the physiology of the cortical circuit, but not all of the finite details. And the reason why that's the appropriate level of modeling for us is because of where these signals come from. And so now I want to show you where these signals come from and step back into why this is the appropriate scale to use for the neural model. So when you record EEG or MEG outside of the head, first thing that you can do is imply this inverse solution method. What the inverse solution method does is it estimates where in the brain did this signal come from and what is its magnitude and time course. This electrical current is known as a primary current. It's a big electrical current that creates what we record outside of the head. And so you can estimate from your sensor where that is and what it looks like over time. Then you have to think about how are these electrical currents related to the underlying neural network. These big electrical currents come from the intracellular postsynaptic current flow and these long and spatially extended cortical pyramidal neurons. These dendrites are aligned in such a way that you get this huge electrical current across a large population. This big electrical current creates an electric and a magnetic field that you record outside of the head. So knowing that this is where this signal comes from, there's some key canonical features of cortical circuitry that you need to take into account when you want to build a model that represents this particular signal or electrical current. And I apologize, I keep Sorry, this is a <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of cats running around here. Lasers on the sky. Where is it? Uh, I don't have that stick. <laughs> okay. So, what are the key canonical features of cortical circuitry to consider? Well, the first is the cortex is a layered structure. There are pyramidal neurons with these extended dendrites in both the supragranular and infragranular layers. There's also inhibitory interneurons in these layers that are important for how they contribute to the network dynamics, but they don't contribute to what you record, uh, directly contribute to what you record outside of the head. These cortical networks don't sit in isolation. They're always receiving input from other parts of the brain. And there's two primary pathways of input to consider. Um, one is what's called lemniscothalamic input. This is the input that's relayed from the periphery through the thalamus and into the cortex, it's up to the granular layers, and then propagates to the proximal dendrites of these pyramidal neurons. In our model, we call it proximal drive because of where it hits the dendrites. There's also another pathway of input to the cortex right into the supragranular layers. This is the input that comes from higher to lower order cortex, where there's also these non-specific thalamic nuclei that project right up to the supergranular layers. And so you have to account for these two distinct pathways of input to the local circuit. The primary electrical current, what I talked about, comes from the intracellular current flow across the whole population of pyramidal neurons. And so the units of measure are current over distance, nanoampere meters. And if you construct a model with this level of detail, 
you have one-to-one -one correspondence between the health care view model and your source localized data. They're in the same units. Now, we know something about the size of the networks that contribute to some of the most commonly measured EEG signals. Um, we often study ERPs, event-related potentials. You give a sensory stimulus, you get some kind of an event-related response. They tend to be on the order of 10 to 100 nanoampere meters and are thought to be generated by the synchronous activity of on the order of tens of thousands of thermal neurons. Low frequency oscillations, which are the other dominant signal you record outside of the head, alpha rhythms, beta rhythms, they're much larger. They tend to be on the order of 100 to 1,000 nanoampere meters, and they're thought to be generated by on the order of a million pyramidal neurons that are subthreshold. Not that you have a million <coughs> pyramidal neurons firing action potentials. That would be very epileptic. You have the subthreshold activity over a huge population. And so knowing this, we've constructed this canonical model of a cortical circuit. Um, I'm not going to give you all of the details, but for those of you who may be interested in neural modeling, I'll just describe it a little bit. So for the pyramidal neurons are simulated with what we call multi-compartment neurons, where we have these little cylinders for the different compartments of the neurons. Inhibitory neurons are single compartment neurons. We have GABAergic and glutamatergic synapses between these. We simulate the electrical activity in each of these compartments with, with what's called a Hodgkin-Huxley current balance equation. You have a capacitive current. It's the sum of a bunch of ionic currents, sodium, potassium, calcium. And then because we have multiple compartments, we have this axial current. Um, and of course, synaptic inputs from other areas. And so we have a whole bunch of these differential equations all coupled together. And that's how we simulate the electrical activity of the neurons. For this exogenous input through these two pathways, what we do is we generate trains of action potentials. We're not simulating every single brain area that drives this network. We define predefined trains of action potentials that excite the local network with excitatory synapses in these um, projection patterns to the proximal or distal brains. So we simulate action potentials, they activate synapses in the local network, and then you get current flow and other things going on. And again, a quick question: What about the term uh, of the derivative of voltage with respect to uh, the distance? That's um, that's this axial current. And this axial current creates your primary current. So this is our um, primary current measure. And again, the units, it's current over distance. I just sum it up across all the pyramidal neurons. So I get nanoampere meters, and I can compare that directly to my data. OK. So this is a reduced representation of the model. The full network contains a scalable number of pyramidal neurons in the supergranular and infragranular layers um, in a three to one ratio with inhibitory neurons, which we know is the ratio in the cortex. Typically, when we're using this model, we're simulating 100 pyramidal neurons in each layer. Um, but it's the scale in the model, and you can make it as big as you want. The unique thing about this model in comparison to other models of EEG or MEG signal is that we're calculating the intracellular current flow in the pyramidal neuron dendrites and not using a more reduced representation like a neural mass model. We've created this now into a user-friendly software. I'm going to show you this software at the end of the talk, but it's being distributed from a new website. Um, and we have tutorials on how to start to study some of the most commonly measured signals like ERPs and low frequency oscillations. And so in thinking about what types of signals you can study with HNN, the types of signals we want to be able to study are dictated by the types of analyses that we do with EEG data. And again, there are various levels of complexity. And so at the minimal level of complexity, we can look at activity from a single brain area and look at things like an evoked response in that brain area or an oscillation in that brain area. We can do more interesting analyses where we look at inter-area fun functional connectivity, phase coherence, power coherence, or we can look at the whole network um, and apply interesting multi-area network state analysis, machine learning algorithms to classify network states in really interesting things. Of course, we want to be able to do all of this with HNN, but right now it's designed to simulate what I call the lowest hanging fruit to connect to microcircuit DCS, which is activity from a single brain area, and we're focusing on these commonly measured event-related potentials and low-frequency oscillations. So that's the underlying model. Now I'm going to 
switch to describe to you how we've used this to study the mechanisms and meaning underlying these approximately 20 hertz oscillations that we measure in somatosensory cortex. And so this is what our signal looks like. We do these tasks where we have subjects sitting, and we're briefly tapping the finger. We're asking, did you feel that? Did you not feel that? And then we're looking in the brain to see, well, what are the markers of um, detection or perception? And so when the subject is sitting with either MEG or EEG, we see very consistent phenomena at each. We do a source localization analysis to isolate the contribution from the hand area of S1. And this is what the signal looks like when the subject's just sitting there before I tap the finger. And what you can see is there's this large amplitude, low frequency oscillation. If we put a frequency filter on this signal, so this is frequency over time, we get high power in this 20 hertz, what we call theta band. But the power fluctuates at any moment in time. And so one of the questions that we asked was, does the power in this pre stimulus period before I tap the finger predict whether the subject's going to feel that tap or not? And the answer to that question is yes. Here I'm showing you we average across time, we average across the beta band, we average across subjects. And now I'm sorting from low to high power for any trial and the probability of detection, which is um, a hit rate from the mean. So the higher it is, the more likely you are to detect. The less data you have before you tap the finger, the more likely you are to feel this tap to the finger. So in this sense, we think of beta as some kind of an inhibitory process. You've also seen that these beta rhythms go away with attention. If I say pay attention to your finger, you decrease beta, suggesting that you're getting this oscillation out of the way for optimal information processing. We've also seen that power increases with aging which presumably maps onto a decrease in tactile detection acuity. Um, in the motor system, beta oscillations are overexpressed in Parkinson's disease, where they have trouble initiating mo movement. In medications that alleviate the motor symptoms, they also decrease this overexpression of beta. So there's lots of evidence that beta seems to be inhibitory to function. Not all bad, because we need it for optimal information processing, but nonetheless inhibitory. And so the main question we've been interested in why? Why does beta inhibit function? And so to address that question, we're going to turn to our model and we're going to try to understand what are the mechanisms in the circuit that create this beta oscillation and how do those mechanisms translate to inhibited function? I don't feel that tap to the thing. Now, before we could go in and use our model, there were several things we had to do to our data. We had to under, have a better understanding of what it is we were trying to simulate. Now, in these examples that I've shown you and in most of the literature, we average. We average across time, we average across the frequency span, we average across subjects, and then we correlate an average signal with some function. But the brain isn't averaging. At any moment in time, you're going to be in beta at some power or you're not. And so the first thing that we did is we had to take a look at what does beta look like in our unaveraged data. Once we know that, we can ask, well, what features are contributing to these functionally relevant differences in power that we see? What does it mean to have high power in this signal? Once we know that, we can use our model to study, well, what are the circuit mechanisms creating these differences in power? And then lastly, how do these mechanisms translate to, I didn't feel that tap to the finger? And the punchline that I'm gonna get to after answering all these questions is that using this modeling framework, We've come up with a new theory about where these beta rhythms come from that predict that what this oscillation is doing is it's recruiting inhibition in the supergranular layers. And that inhibition is decreasing the relay of information out of S1. Right? And if the signal doesn't get out of the primary somatosensory cortex, it never gets to the rest of the brain for you to say, I felt that tap to the brain. So now I'm going to walk you through how we answered each of these questions to get to this new theory. Okay, first question, what does it look like in unaveraged data? It turns out that these beta rhythms are really <coughs> transient. They typically last less than 150 milliseconds. And so what I'm showing you here is the raw time trace from 10 different pre-stimulus periods. And this is the corresponding frequency response. And I'm highlighting in red boxes high power in the beta band. Now, because in the frequency domain, these signals are always positive. When you average, they accumulate without cancellation, and you get this beautiful band of activity. 
And your brain automatically thinks, oh, I had this nice ongoing oscillation. When in fact, you had this very transient thing that was either there or not there at some time in that pre-stimulus window. And more often, we do something like this, where we also average across time. We get this power spectral density and we say, oh, this peak changes in one condition or another condition. But by doing that, we've lost all sense of what's going on in the underlying signal. And we need this in order to say, yes, this is an accurate representation of what this signal looks like. We found that this transient phenomena of beta activity is highly conserved across recording modalities and species. And so I have a collaboration with Professor Chris Moore at Brown University where they're doing similar experiments in mice where they're flicking the whisker and asking the mouse, did you feel it or didn't you feel it? And here again, we're looking at the spontaneous activity in the period before you tap the finger or flick the whisker, we're putting the same MATLAB code on both of these signals. This is a local field potential. This is a current source um, from MEG data. And we see remarkable consistency. We've looked at things like how many events in the pre-stimulus period, what is the power of these events, how long do they last, what's their frequency span. And you can see this remarkable consistency, suggesting there's some conserved macro-scale phenomena creating this beta signal. Um, I want to point out that we now have this toolbox, this open source toolbox, so that you can start to look at your data using these event analyses. The other thing we've seen is that if you look at the waveform underlying this high power, and so here's the raw signal, we go in the frequency domain, we find a high power event, and then we just pull out the raw signal. And here I'm overlaying 50 high power and beta events on top of each other. And this is the average across multiple subjects. And what you can see is there's remarkable consistency in this shape. There's a stereotypical waveform for these macro scale things that consists of this negative deflection where this lasts approximately 50 milliseconds. Because that lasts 50 milliseconds, you put a frequency filter on that and you get high power in the beta band. But it is not a 50 millisecond oscillation. You had an oscillation, you also get high power in the beta band. There's a very statistically significant shape here that suggests there's some really robust underlying phenomena. I want to emphasize this point that different waveforms can give exactly the same high power in using frequency analysis. And so here we have three very different waveforms. I put the same frequency filter on them. They all give me high power at approximately 20 hertz. It's a mechanism in the brain that can create a signal that looks like this versus this versus this is very different. And so taking a step back and understanding what our signal looks like can be very powerful in connecting it to how could the brain create that signal. Now, this middle one is the waveform shape that we see in our somatosensory cortex. We've seen similar things in motor cortex where the uh, sharpness of this peak reflects motor deficits in Parkinson's disease. And when they have DDS, that sharpness goes away. Um, they've also been seen to track errors, motor errors in motor cortex. And so there are more and more studies showing that this is a robust phenomenon. Okay, so what does beta look like? They're transient, I call them events. Um, and they have this stereotypical waveform. So given that, what does it mean to have high power? And so when I first start, started studying this oscillation and thinking about how do I get high power, you automatically think, well, high power, I have a larger amplitude oscillation. I have a bigger network contributing to my signal. But now that we know these things are transient, there's several features that could contribute to a high difference in power over average from low to high. So here I'm showing you, it could be that we have a different number of events. So this is a pre stimulus period. I could have one event or two events that are equal power. I average this, I get high power. I average that, I get low power. It could also be that the events are higher in amplitude. And so you have in one condition, a low power event. This way, it's still one event, but it has high power. I average this, I get high power. I average that, I get low power. Could be that the durations are different, or it could be that the frequency span changes. Any one of these could underlie a functionally relevant difference in power. And so we ask the question in our data, well, which one is contributing to a high versus low power? And it turns out that it's very clearly the number of events. And so here I'm showing you a, a correlation between low to high power and low to not high, num 
number of pre-sinless events. This is for the power of the events, the duration and the frequency band, band and this is just a Pearson's correlation coefficient over 10 subjects. And you can see very clearly that as power goes up, it's because the number of events has gone up. You're getting more of these in the pre-stimulus period. Again, we saw this phenomenon highly conserved across tasks. This is, we did this as a task where we looked at shifts in attention and across species similar in the mouse somatosensory cortex. And so when we have high power, it's because we had more of these events happening in the pre-stimulus period. Now, does that mean that it's because we have more stick events that we don't feel the tap to the finger? Maybe there's something different going on that's impacting perception. And so next we looked at how do each of these features correlate with perception? And so here is our human detection task. What I'm just doing here is I'm sorting the number of events from low to high, their power, their duration, the frequency span, and then I'm correlating that with detection as, again, a hit rate as a percent change from the mean. So the higher it is, the more likely you are to feel it. You can see very clearly that the only statistically significant effect that we found was with the number of events. If you have more events, you're less likely to feel this tap to the finger. We also looked at it in our attention data. And as you pay attention, you're less likely to have an event in the hand representation. And again, we saw something very consistent in the mouse data. And so what the brain seems to be doing is when I say pay attention to your finger, you decrease the probability of these beta events occurring in the finger representation. And by doing that, you're better able to feel that tap to the finger. So the next natural question is, well, does the timing of that event matter? If an event came right before I tap the finger versus a long time before I tap the finger, does that matter? And the answer to that is also yes. What I'm showing you here is the timing of the most recent beta event. I'm going to tap the finger. When was the beta event before it? The closer the event is to the time of that tap, the less like the more likely you are to say, I didn't feel the tap. So if they're closer, the effect lasts approximately 300, 400 milliseconds. And again, similar in the LFP and the mice performing fibrosa detection. So what features underlie clinically relevant sense differences in power? The number of beta events is greater during non-detected trials. And, um, not during, sorry, non-attended, non-detected trials, and non-detected trials have more recent data events. So now we can get to the real question, which is what are the circuit mechanisms that create this phenomena? And why do those mechanisms translate to, I'm not going to feel that tap? And so we're going to turn to our model, and we're going to use this model to understand the mechanisms that create this stereotypical beta event. Now, this is a large-scale model, thousands of differential equations, hundreds of thousands of parameters. And you have to have a way to kind of constrain this madness. And I always get the thing, well, can't you produce anything you want with this model in a hundred different ways? The answer is no. There is structure in here that dictates what you will see. Um, and there was a method to constraining this model. And the, our method was as follows. The first thing that we did is we built the individual neurons. We fixed their morphology and their physiology so that they reproduced realistic spiking patterns to injected current. And so these guys fire adapting spike trains. These guys are bursting. This is based on a lot of literature um, of the physiology and somatosensory cortex. And we fixed all that. All those equations, all those parameters, we fixed them. Then we built in the local network connectivity. And again, there's a large body of literature of how cortical circuits are connected to each other. And we fixed all that. The only parameters that we started playing with to understand where does this come from were the timing and the strength of these exogenous inputs, generating these trains of action potentials that drive this network in some way. And that's what we played around with. And from a long history of trial and error and using this model in a million ways that it didn't work, we came up with a prediction of how it might work which is as follows. The model predicts that we have two bursts of activity that hit the cortex at the same time. And as long as this one is strong in the last 50 milliseconds, we get a beta event. And to see why that comes about in our model, 
we look at the histogram of the drive. So this is what we call the proximal drive. This is the burst of input that's going to come up, the proximal dendrites. It's simultaneous with this burst of input to the distal dendrites. Now, this input hits excitatory synaptic currents. This proximal drive, what that's going to do, it's going to come in and it's going to push current flow up the dendrites. So if I only had the proximal drive, I'd get a waveform that looks like this. But at the same time, I have this distal input coming in. It's pushing current flow very strongly down the dendrites and breaking that upward current flow. And so now we get this nice waveform where the reason that this is a beta period again is because this distal drive lasts 50 milliseconds. Now this was a prediction that came out of our model and showed very close agreement with our human data. But because we have a lot of detail in this model, we could go in and test it in animal recordings. And we were fortunate enough to have collaboration with Chris Moore at Brown and also with Charlie Shorter and Saskia Higgins um, at the Nathan Klein and Columbia University who had laminar recordings from both mice and monkeys. And we went in and we looked for evidence of this model prediction and found, in fact, validation that this was the mechanism creating these stereotypical beta events. Um, so this is very exciting, of course, because the theory came from developing a very biophysically principled model that could simulate this signal with one-to-one -one comparison and led to this new prediction that we then found evidence for. Okay, so here's our prediction. Beta events emerge from a broad proximal excitatory synaptic drive that's simultaneous with a strong distal drive. And this distal drive lasts 50 milliseconds. That's the mechanism. So how do these mechanisms translate to I didn't feel that tap to the finger? Remember, you have this in the pre-stimulus period. If it's there, no, nope, I didn't feel it. And so the way that we've investigated this is by looking at how do these pre-stimulus events impact the filtering of that incoming information? And so we looked at the sensory evoked response. So you tap the finger, you get an ERP in somatosensory cortex. This is what it looks like. What we've done here is we've sorted trials where we didn't have a beta event or we did have a beta event, right? We look in the pre-stimulus period, is there an event or isn't there an event? We also sorted the data a different way where these were trials where the subject felt it and these were trials where the subject didn't feel it. And what you can see is that there's remarkable consistency in the relationship between what a beta event does to the signal and how that signal relates to detection. We don't have an event you start higher and you get this briefer and sharper rising waveform. If you did have an event, you start lower, then you get this broader peak in a shallower rise. That's exactly what beta is doing to this signal. And so it suggests there's some causal relationship between having a beta event and saying, I felt that tap to the finger. And so the question is, how do these beta events influence the shape of this evoked response? And why does that shape correspond to, I didn't feel the tap to the finger? And so now we're going to go into our model and we're going to simulate an evoked response. And we're going to do that either with or without a beta event and see what our model tells us. And so first I want to show you how we simulate an evoked response. This is one of the first things we did with this model um, back in 2007. We were looking at taps to the finger and we said, here's the ERP from the tap to the finger. Where does it come from in the neural circuit? And we used the same procedure that we did for the rhythms in that we fixed everything. And all that we did was we simulated the sequence of input to this local circuit, thinking about what happens to the local cortical circuit when you tap the finger. When you tap the finger, input comes in through the thalamus and goes up to the cortex. And so the first thing that happens is you get drive in this proximal projection pattern. Then that signal very quickly goes to another part of the brain and comes back to S1. It goes to S2, and then it comes back to S1, and it comes back in the supragranular layers. And so I can generate a train of action potentials that drives the network in the supragranular layers. Then you get a thalamocortical loop of activity, and you get more proximal drive. This sequence of drive is motivated by a large history of literature. We built it into our model to see, can this sequence of input that happens after you tap the finger account for the ERP. And in fact, it can. The blue is the output from the model. The black is our actual data. 
So what did I tune here? I tuned the pattern of this drive and the strength of this drive. And by doing that, I could recreate this waveform. The other thing I want to point out is that this sequence of activity is also able to account for ERPs in other brain areas. So this is a somatosensory evoked potential. This is an auditory evoked potential from a, a letter. This is from a brief flash of a checkerboard in the visual cortex. And you can see there's differences, but they all go up, and then they go down, and then they go up again. And with the same sequence of drive, but tuning the parameters of that drive, we could reproduce the signature. I want to suggest that these macro scale features are really dictated by canonical features of cortical circuitry. You have structure, you have patterns of input, and that's conserved in different parts of the brain in the sequence of drive that account for that. Okay, so now back to our question. Uh, why, how does a beta event impact this waveform in the way that when sorting over detection, we have such that if you have an beta event, you get a shallower rise and you're not going to feel the tap to the finger. We go into our model. So here's our question. How did these beta events influence the evoked response? And why does that correspond to, I didn't feel that tap? So we're going to go into our model. We're going to simulate a beta event. And then we're going to simulate the tap to the finger, either with or without a beta event. And when we do that in the model, we see remarkably the model is able to reproduce these signature differences that we see in our data. Now, I always stop at this point in my talk because we actually did this in the model first. And then we went back and looked in the data to say, well, the model would predict this is what we should see if we sort our data this way. And that's what we found. And again, this was really remarkable. Um, and I, I dealt with neural models for a long time, even before building this model. We used to use these point neuron models and these reduced representations of neural activity. And it wasn't until we included the right structure in the model that all these new and generative predictions started to come about once we actually accounted for the biophysics of this thing. Okay. So now we know that the model can reproduce it. How does it do that? And why is it that when you see this waveform, the subject says, I didn't capture the finger. If I had a beta, I'm sorry. I have a beta event, I didn't feel the tap to the finger. finger. Well, what the model is suggesting is that, that the mechanism that creates the beta event, remember, it's this strong drive to the distal brain joints. That's recruiting inhibition in the supergranule layers. If you have inhibition in the supergranule layers and you tap the finger, when this input starts to come back in and drive this current flow down, it can't get in. And so, you have shunting of this feedback input. That creates an overall decrease in the firing in these pyramidal neurons, and so you get a shallower signal out here. If you have a decrease in firing in these pyramidal neurons, the pyramidal neurons are what relay the information outside of S1. If you have less firing in them, then you're going to have a decrease relay of information. The signal doesn't get out of S1, and the subject says, I didn't feel the tap to the finger. And the way that we saw this in the model is because it's a model, we can look at anything we want. And so here we can go in and we can look at the spiking activity of the neurons. And so here's our simulated evoked response with a beta event and without a beta event. This is overlaid on the spiking activity from the different cell populations. I have pyramidal neurons and interneurons in the supergranular layers, layer 2, 3, and I have pyramidal neurons and interneurons in the intergranular layers, layer 5. And you can see without a beta event, I get lots of spiking everywhere. If I have a beta event, I get this inhibition in the supergranular layers before even the, the tap even gets to cortex. It takes about 25 milliseconds for the tap to get to cortex. And so then the input doesn't get in, everything else is gone. And so I get no spiking. And if I get no spiking in my pyramidal neurons, I don't get out of S1. So we don't feel the tap. And so, the model is predicting that beta decreases the salience of sensory input to the recruitment of supergranular inhibition, which decreases the relay of information out of S1. Okay, so for the last part of my talk, I just want to show you what our software now looks like, um, some other applications, and where we're going next. And so this is a freely distributed software. It's embedded in a graphical user interface. It runs now on all platforms. Um, and when you start the software, this is the graphical user interface that you see. 
On the top is a schematic representation in the underlying cortical column model. When you start the model, this model is art, start the software, this model is automatically created. And here's the main GUI window. And so the way that you would use this is the first thing that we would do is you would go in and you would load your data file. And so you find the data on your computer and you load it in and it'll come up in this main GUI window. The next thing you're going to do is you're going to, sorry, this is a little grainy, but you're going to set the parameters that define your simulation experiment. Simulation experiment consists of doing something to this local network that depends on what your experiment is. In this case, we're going to simulate an evoked response, and so I'm going to go in and I'm going to define the sequence of drive. I've already done that here. Then I'm going to hit run simulation, and the output of my model is going to be shown overlaid with my data. So you have this one-to-one -one comparison. Now, and obviously I've tuned this model to get a nice representation of the data. Suppose I have a patient population. And the waveform looks different. And I think, oh, I think it's because there's some kind of disruption in the EI balance, the local excitatory to inhibitory connectivity. I can very easily go into the model, change the EI balance, re-simulate my network, and see what did that parameter change do to the output of my model. And so you have this nice interactive GUI where you change parameters and you directly see what that does to the signal. And again, because it's a model, we have our macro scale signal, but we can also go in and look at the micro scale activity. And so you can go in and you can view the layer specific responses. You can view the spiking activity of all the different cells in the network. You can look at the frequency response. There's lots of different ways that you can go in and say, what is the detailed prediction? And then use that detailed prediction to go validate it with other imaging modalities or invasive recordings or something else. Again, this is distributed through a website. We have lots of information there simulating ERPs, oscillations, alpha rhythms, beta rhythms, gamma rhythms. And our hope is that by teaching the community how we did this, and we give you our data and our parameter sets, you'll start to get a sense of how to apply it to the signals that you have. Okay, so, so what are the, some of the other applications? I've shown you that we've looked at these oscillations and these ERPs. My group is now starting to use some of this information to try to develop new brain stimulation paradigms. So we know that these beta events are transient, and they're created by these bursts of input. And so we're starting to create new TMS patterns that represent this burst of input in the same pattern that the cortex is doing. We don't have any data on that yet, but we hope to soon. We've also used the model to look at the impact of transcranial alternating current on the circuit. So we did this study where we did 10 hertz transcranial alternating current to S1. We wanted to see, can we impair perception? We didn't, and we didn't drive 10 hertz oscillations, but we did see a difference in the tactile evoked response before and after we did CATS, and we used the model to test the prediction. Was that because we had some change in the synaptic efficacy between the neuron populations? And it turns out changing the GABAergic synapse specifically could account for the difference that we saw in our data. Other groups have used this to look at differences with autism, where they've seen some differences in beta rhythms and gamma rhythms in typically developing versus autistic children, and they had some predictions about how feed forward and feedback pathways contribute to that. Uh, we're collaborating now with a group, group at the West Haven VA Hospital who's collecting EEG and looking at signatures of improved improvements in depression with ketamine. So we're using the model to try to understand what is ketamine doing to the circuit that then maps onto the EEG signal. We also have some ongoing studies in development. We're collaborating with Doug Chain at SickKids in Toronto, who's looking at motor evoked potentials and their role in response inhibition and development. And this got cut off here, but we're starting to use HNN to simulate that signal. There's several directions which we're trying to expand the software. One thing that we're doing is we're integrating it with source localization software. And so the first thing you do with the signal is you source localize it to say, where did it come from? And so we're integrating, I'm collaborating with Marky Hamalini at um, National Hospital. And so you'll have one package where you can do both your source localization and your circuit interpretation. We're also trying to expand it so that people can bring in other models. And so right now in the software, you get our model. If you know how to code in Neuron Python, you can change our model, it's open source. Most of the community doesn't, and it's hard right now to build neural models unless you have the expertise in that. This group at SUNY Downstate has created this new platform called NetPine. 
It has a graphical user interface and it's allowing people to very easily create network models without having to do any coding. Again, you can do coding if you know how, but if you don't, it's a really, I think, powerful tool to bring you. Um, and we're also working on visualizing things like local field potentials and its current source density, ECOG. All of this stuff can be calculated. It's, it's just more math, um, and we're just still working on that in our software. So that brings me to the end of my talk. Uh, my conclusions are that HNN is this neocortical column model, column model under thalamic cortical and cortical drive that simulates the primary currents that create EEG and MEG based on their biophysical origin. By combining this with invasive recordings, we've come up with a novel prediction about where these beta rhythms come from. It's also predicting that they're decreasing the salience of information through the recruitment of supergranular inhibition, and we're working on testing that prediction now with collaboration um, with our collaborators who are doing animal Software is distributed through this new website where we have documentation, installation, tutorials. We have a user's forum for troubleshooting. Um, and hopefully, I've convinced you that HNN can be applied to uncover circuit mechanisms underlying EEG and MEG signals in health and neuropathology, and hopefully, ultimately, aid in the development of new treatments, either with pharmacology or brain stimulation. Um, I just want to end by thanking my collaborators. <laughs> My interdisciplinary research program requires a lot of collaboration, um, and I feel really fortunate to have developed this network of interactions that allow us to do this multidisciplinary research. I'm highlighting here the HNN development team. It's developed by a team at Brown, at Yale, the neuron team, um, and this team at Mass General Hospital. We have funding sources, um, and with that, I'll leave you with my conclusions, and happy to answer questions. Information in what 45 minutes, I think. It was good. I like that. Thank oh, you. No, very nice. Um, so, one of the things we'd like to go to a talk in Texas, right? Shamefully disappointed. And I'm not an EEG person, although I practice in my sleep, but I've started to get more involved with that. And, and the, your characterization of data as events and mm -hmm. looking at the unfiltered data as opposed to the average over time and stuff like that mm -hmm. I think is is a, a fascinating way to look at it and that you essentially have by calling them events you're focusing on individual occurrences of yes. these particular patterns yep. which you know I think speaking as somebody who's not really an EEG person sort of by the traditional view that it's an oscillation that's sequential like the example you showed to the left that everything's squiggling at a certain frequency. You know, if you'd have asked me before your talk, I'd have thought, well, that's pretty probably pretty common. But essentially you get me thinking, no, that's right. When you go in, in a sense, averaging obscures the reality of what's happening at the circuit level. Exactly. And then is is that you're looking at alpha, for example, another frequency. Mm -hmm. Bands. Are you seeing the same thing too? Are there alpha events or yes. you know gamma events, things like that? Absolutely. Um, if you close your eyes and you record in the back of the head, you see beautiful continuous oscillations. Right. If you hold something really tight, your beta continues on. And so it depends on the experimental condition. Okay. When we're doing these detection tasks, um, but let me just say, I, I think of the reason that it's continuous is because I'm continuing to drive the circuit. You know, I've got this this action that's doing something different than if I'm just sitting there and I have a spontaneous oscillation. Uh, so the mechanisms that create these things, even though they're in the same frequency band, they could be very different. For alpha in our hands, we see that it's also transient. And so you can kind of see that when I showed those plots, they, they're those alpha events and beta events. Um, and so we're seeing sim similar phen phenomena in the wake of the sensory cortex. It's not to say that there aren't these periods of shh, when you no, see sure, it. Sure. Um, but you can quantify all of that. How often, how long do they last? And we also see that alpha doesn't last very long. It's less than 300 milliseconds. Right, right. One could infer that the power was because you had longer trains of the oscillation. But what you're saying is really Maybe the not. best contributor to the overall power is just simply the number of those individual events, some of which are buried in, in, in you know, a, a few 
milliseconds of that pattern, but some of them could just be a bunch of individual events that are just kind of exactly. thrown in there. Okay. And so when we're thinking about theories about why these oscillations matter for function, it's a very different thought process if you think of them as stochastic events versus right. something that's right. setting up a phase. Not that the event doesn't have phase information in mm -hmm. it, and mm -hmm. different parts of that, different things will happen, but in creating theories around oscillations and why they matter for function, I think we have to step back a little bit and think more critically about what is our oscillation really mean? What is a change in power, which is what we, what, it, what does that mean? What is space right. locking mean right. Right. if you don't have a reliable measure of space? I think more and more um, the field is moving that way. And if you don't mind a follow-up, yeah. the, the flip side of seeing the data events suppressing the impact of input, mm -hmm. the flip side of that is whatever turns off the data events essentially could be something important for attentional processes, yep. arousal, things like that. Yep, and we do see that attention turns them off. Okay. Um, and I didn't talk about this, but we think that, you know, so we have these bursts of input and they drive the cortex. I didn't talk at all about where they come from. We think that they're coming from different thalamic nuclei. So we've got this lemnisco and this non lemnisco thalamic pathway. And these non lemnisco thalamic pathways have broad distribution across the cortex. And so they would have the ability to kind of control where these things are going to happen. You're talking so, like interlaminar thalamus? Yes, yeah. Kind of For us, we're looking projection. at the VM. Okay. Um, All right. Yeah. Okay. But theory, we're not sure. It could be S2, it could, could be motor cortex. All we know from our model is that it's super good. There's very similar patterns that we have to stimulus during their decreased alpha that are more likely to stimulus regions. Yeah. So it could be, each of the mechanisms could be similar, but it's a, a different frequency. So we also see that phenomenon. So I, I'm only talking about beta here, but our signal is alpha, actually this alpha-beta complex. Sometimes you get an alpha, sometimes you get a beta. They both, on average, inhibit function. The more alpha you have, you're not going to fill the top. Okay. Beta has this nice linear relationship with more beta, less detection. Alpha has this inverted U. So if you've got a lot, you're bad. If you have a little, you're not so bad. And so there's something different between alpha and beta. We also see that with attention, alpha shifts immediately. Like I tell you, pay attention, you decrease your alpha or you increase it in the non-attentive representation immediately. Beta shifts don't happen until right before I tap the finger. And so the subjects learn very quickly that even though I randomize the tap of the finger, you get at least a second. And so it's like 800 milliseconds. Now they start to use beta where immediate, in this attention test, where immediately alpha is engaged. So there's something separable about them. In our model, the way that we get alpha is we take these two inputs, and we delay them a little. And if I delay them a little, this one pushes you up, this one pushes you down. It each lasts about 50 milliseconds, and we get it. And so that's the mechanism in our model. We have a paper from 2009 where we show that if we had stochastic input, they're both going at 10 hertz, right? Sometimes they come in together, sometimes they come in in part. It's stochastic on any cycle of this 10 hertz input, and we get this beautiful alpha beta complex that matches all these features we have here. We're still working on testing a lot of this. Thank you very much for Mm -hmm. 
That's that's a very good question. And the answer is I don't know. Um, I when I first started with this, it was all hand tuning. There was no optimization. It was just changing parameters and getting a sense of what does this parameter do? What does that parameter do? Um, and it was trial and error where we finally came to a mechanism that worked. And so we haven't yet gone in and said, let's do a huge parameter sweep and see if there's a hundred other mechanisms that work. Because it makes sense, like it's motivated by hypothesis, right? We know the thalamus is bursting at 10 hertz. We know that there's two pathways of information. So it wasn't totally random that I tried this sequence of input. It was based on some kind of hypothesis about what might be happening in the brain that drove me to try a specific parameter regime. Now, if we have the computing power, we can, of course, sweep through lots of different things and see if something else might account. And maybe there's five. There's not going to be 5,000 because it's dictated by structure. And there is EI balance. You know, you can't wildly change the intrinsic Currents, are you going to get some weird behavior out of the cell? So you can't change everything without making things just be strange. So keeping things in a realistic regime, there's certain parameters that there's some flexibility with, particularly in the drive patterns. Who knows what that is? Um, and so that's where we can start. To now, we do now have parameter optimization in the software. We evoked response, where if you get kind of a good representation, but it's not quite fitting, then you can run optimization around targeted parameters. Like I know this sequence is important, but I don't have my values exactly right. I don't know if it should be stronger to excitatory or inhibitory cells. And so at that level, you can run parameter optimization. It's ours, but it will run on a laptop, which we're very proud of, because parameter optimization in a large scale model is a large scale problem. And it's computationally very expensive. To do. I have another question. This is stimulating a lot of thought here. So your model includes important aspects of the laminar organization, the directionality of the dendrites and things like that. Mm -hmm. What do you think is going to happen when you have a pathology? So something like schizophrenia, mm -hmm. where that itself could be very different. So I mean, the extreme example being the information on hippocampus and the sort of lack of organization in the pyramidal cell layers. Do you think it's possible that eventually you can incorporate some of those structural changes in, and that might predict some of the EEG abnormalities that are seen? You can do that in the model now. It's one of the parameters that's exposed. Okay. So you could go in and you could remove some of the dendrites. Okay. You could make them skinnier. You could remove a population. You could make them shorter. Have them quite different directions. That's harder. You okay. can do it. If you know how to code, okay. but that's not a that's not a knob okay. in the GUI right now. But there are knobs in the GUI that represent structure, morphology, mm -hmm. um, physiology. A lot of that's exposed. Um, the things that aren't exposed, changing the cell types. That's why we're converting to net time. So then you can create your own cell type, your own network, and pull it in. Um, it's also hard right now to change the connectivity structure. So you can change the strength of the synapses, but we have this Gaussian connectivity structure across the network where you get smaller for smaller Gaussian for inhibitory neurons, a larger Gaussian for primal neurons. That's a hard thing to change in the code unless you know how to do some coding. Not it. Not. But again, NetPine is creating a framework where you can create connectivity structures in lots of different ways. So once we have that, then any of these questions will be easier to answer. Right now, you get our model. <laughs> Unless you know how to code, there's only certain things you can change. You can change a lot, but not everything. And if people have certain things they want to look at or change, we're eager to get the community using this tool. It's brand new. Um, and so we're happy to answer questions. If you say, I want to look at the calcium currents in this cell type, can you expose that? Sure. I mean, you can change right now the calcium conductance, but you can't look at calcium going up and down the dendrites. For Maybe you want to, and we could easily do that, but we want to be driven by the questions in the community other than just that. Oh, go ahead. I don't know. I was thinking that probably we should wrap up. Um, we have more time. Oh, okay. Sure. I'll just bring it up. 
Usually I go over, over, but I don't think I did. No, not at all. <laughs> did. Um, thank you for leaving. So you were talking towards the end about um, current plans that you don't have data yet in terms of inhibiting perception by using, for example, mimicking data with TMS or other kinds of neuromodulation techniques. Yeah. I assume that would mean that it's also very tricky to create a sensation rather than inhibiting based on what you're doing right now. Yeah, so to like remove these so that we could increase the ability to. Um, I haven't actually thought about how you might remove them. We know we can do it with attention. Um, but maybe you could drive attention circuits and do it. So that more so, somewhat indirectly that yeah. would change the data. Right. Because if they do come from thalamus, you've got to have some way to modulate that. So that made me think about, for example, there's other kind of perceptual changes. Illusions and tactile mm -hmm. illusions and other things could be kind of done in real psychophysics and others, but then I was just curious how that might be like produced. Yeah, I'm not, not sure. I mean, the first thing is what does the signal show? Um, and then we see features in our signal, we can then use the model. And again, what we're finding when you record outside of the head, you don't get everything. You, know, you get macro scale, low frequency oscillations, and ear peaks. This is what 90% of the field is looking at. There's a lot of low hanging fruit to start to think about where these come from. You think about things like polar discharge or kind of if you support yourself, you can't hear sensation of hearing aids and these kind of things that's different from attentional modulations. No, we haven't. That's really interesting. We're thinking now about um, muscle control. So we have a study where we're looking at the physiological impacts of Qigong, which is a mind-body meditation where you're trying to relax, um, and that's going to change your muscle, and you can see correlates of that in the brain, and it's leading to improved health. And so we're thinking about how does the body interact with the brain in a meaningful way, and how we measure that from outside of the head. Maybe we don't need to measure from outside of the head. Maybe we need to measure from the body. And things like tickling and stimulating nerves. We're starting to move in that direction. You mentioned something at the end that is totally fascinating and mm -hmm. I don't know what talking about your participants. They come to be able to control data. So they modulate data in response to what they It seems to be. And so the actual experiment is we tap the finger every three seconds. Well, not every three seconds. The, the trial is three seconds. You get you did two tasks. One was pure detection, where you get a cross, and then when the cross changes color, you have to tell me if you had felt the tap. And so what we did was we between 1,100 and 1,600 milliseconds after the cue, we tap the finger. It's randomized. It gives a second. And we built that in so that we could look at what's the ongoing brain activity before we tap the finger. But we don't tell them, oh, you've got a second, you're just starting to, you see the cross change, now you have to respond, now you have to respond. And when we did our attention task, it was similar, we said hand or foot, and so you had to pay attention, tell me if you felt it in your hand or your foot, even though it might come anywhere. Um, and again, we waited to 1100 milliseconds or 1200 up to 1600 or 1700, randomized. But it was like, we started seeing alpha effects, we started seeing alpha effects immediately after the cue. We didn't see beta effects until right before the tap came. And so it was like somehow they're the brain is predicting that I don't have to tell if I felt this for at least a second. So I'm going to let alpha do whatever it does until I need beta. I mean, this is interpretation just by looking at the timing of these things. We have a 2015 paper that looks at the timing like that. The alpha and beta. Because in S1, you get alpha, beta. This is the whopping big signals. We see it in every subject that we do in scenario. There's some very robust phenomena. And again, with you know, EEG in this model, you don't have access to all the fine details of sparse coding and who, which population. You don't get any of that because you just don't see it. But there's still something very meaningful. Thanks, Thank you so much. Did we take questions from the audience? Oh, usually, I think 